Okay. Um, I've, I've only been to a few of these meetups before. I've quite enjoyed how, how varied the talks are, so I'm going to try and keep that theme going tonight and talk about something which probably hasn't come up here before, but maybe it has, and um, that's the avalanche risk. Um, so because I'm new, I should tell you guys a bit about me. I'm actually um, an engineer um, kind of by trade. Um, recently I've been working in uh, hardware development and supporting high-tech manufacturing. Um, before that I studied physics and I'm kind of doing a number of um, personal projects these days to try and uh, learn some new technologies and skills. And they're always kind of flavoured um, by my interest, which is where we are tonight. Uh, so I'm a ski tourer, and for those of you who that's a, a brand new um, concept for, it's like skiing, but there's no ski field, so um, no lifts or cafes or queues or anything like that. Uh, so you, uh, you get to have a great alpine experience, um, fantastic skiing, and yeah, all the you know all the rewards yours to have, but all the risk is kind of yours to have as well. Um, there's no ski patrol to make the slope safe for you or pick up the pieces if it all goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I run a, a mountaineering course for a um, local tramping club. I manage um, safety of groups in the mountains and teach them about avalanche safety and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's kind of why we're talking about this stuff tonight. Um, so this isn't my photo, but this is how it can look if it all goes wrong. So the, the skier in the middle there has uh, triggered this avalanche. It's it's not a big one, but they're, um, they've been swept off their feet and they're kind of engulfed in the debris. And whatever happens next is, is completely out of their control. Um, they might be swept off a bluff, they might be buried under it all. It's, it's a very bad place to be. So I definitely don't want this to happen to me or anyone I um, you know associate with or anything like that. Um, now there's, there's a lot to the science of avalanches. It's fascinating, but it's probably not the right place to talk about that tonight. That's probably not why everyone's here. Um, but before I get to the tech side of um, what I have to talk about, we just have to run through a, f a few key uh, ideas. So avalanches happen in particular terrain and what I mean by that, um, so th there's a few kind of terrain parameters which, which are, cruci which are crucial um, for you know, whether a slope can avalanche. And the first is the slope aspect. And by that I mean um, what direction it's facing. Is it facing to the north? Is it facing to the east? Uh, so on. And that's important for a couple of reasons. The first is kind of, um, it's, it determines what wind exposure you have and the wind is blowing the snow around and it can generate these big um, snow deposits which can be unstable and cause the avalanche like we saw in the other picture. Um, it also influences the exposure to the sun that you have. Um, so how much yeah, heating you're getting from the sun, which can either act to stabilise or destabilise the slope. So number one, the aspect's important. Number two, the angle of the slope is important. And that's perfectly illustrated by this picture of snow on the roof of a dome. And we can see on the top of the dome, it's not steep enough for the snow to slide, so it sticks. And then we have this danger zone between 30 and 55 degrees where avalanches happen. So that's our second bit of terrain information. 
The third part, and the photo doesn't really have much to do with it, is, is the elevation matters, so how high we are. Um, because generally, the higher you go up a slope, the colder it gets. So that's determining if your snow's um, wet or dry and how the snow on the ground is, is evolving. So to summarize, our relevant terrain parameters for um, determining avalanche terrain are aspect, angle, and elevation. Um, so there's an organization called the New Zealand Avalanche Advisory, and they produce forecasts for um, kind of key alpine areas around the country and um, they're giving an avalanche um, risk prediction and kind of some good um, travel advice. And you can find that, uh, sorry, just break out of this, on avalanche.net.nz. It's sponsored by um, ACC actually, because avalanche accidents are quite expensive. And we can see on the, um, the scale down the bottom, we have a danger, a danger scale or a risk scale from low to extreme. At this end, you're wanting to stay in, sorry, this end's good, the far end, you're wanting to stay indoors. Uh, if I click on one of the areas, then we drill into a report in a lot more detail, and I'm going to go to a historic one, which I've prepared the slides for. So when, and and this is um, sometime in August. So when the page loads, we get a big map at the top um, of the region, a topographic map. So we're looking at the Tongariro area, <coughs> excuse me, um, which has Mount Ruapehu in the central North Island. And, uh, as we look down the page, we get an overall risk rating for the area. Um, and then they start to drill into the, the forecasted risk in, in more detail. So it's broken down into different elevation bands. So high alpine, above 2,300 metres. And we've got considerable risk for that area. And then um, lower band, subalpine and alpine. <coughs> so this is, this is pretty useful information for us. Um, also in this, in this forecast, there's um, some more detailed descriptions of, of what the likely avalanche phenomena is because of course there's, there's different flavours of these things. So in this bulletin, they're warning about this thing called a, a storm slab. Um, and there's some text describing it, and then probably the most important bit of information on this page is, is this chart here, this rose, and um, it's breaking the avalanche risk down into different um, elevation bands, so we've got the high alpine, alpine, and subalpine, but then also different aspects, so north through to south, and you can see on this one, do I have a pointer on that? Yes, I do. Um, this cell here, for example, so that's saying that um, the chance of an avalanche on an east-facing slope above 2,300 metres is considerable, whereas any west-facing slopes, there's no avalanche risk. So the, the travel choice there is pretty obvious, avoid the east-facing high slopes. Um, this sort of pattern, this um, non-uniformity, is, is pretty typical. Um, and it, ha it has to do with the wind that the snow is falling from. So for this sort of event, or this sort of um, situation, the winds come from the northwest. OK, jumping back to my slides. So if. So we want to apply that information and um, the other things we know about avalanches, like this, 
the slope angle rule um, to terrain so that we can make good travel decisions. We can plot where we should go and where we shouldn't go. And this is going to be a trivial problem if it's like a, a cone-shaped mountain, but if the terrain's more complex, then it's going to be a bit more difficult to apply. So the, the topographic map on the right is, is the summit areas of Mount Ruapehu, which is complex terrain. So there's um, places in the south facing east and north and, and all sorts. And this bit of information about the slope angle, it's very hard to look at the spacing of contour lines and say whether you're above 30 degrees or whether you're only 28. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to do was to take these two bits of information and generate a, a sort of risk layer to superimpose on, on top of this map so that I could, I could um, properly consider this information. So let's talk through that. Um, most of my projects seem to start at Linz. There's some great stuff there. So for this, for my terrain data, I used the New Zealand 8 metre digital elevation model, um, which is a New Zealand wide thing. It's actually generated from topographic maps, uh, some clever way. And it's a big tile data set. So you can download a great big tile, which covers the whole um, Tongariro region, which is which is kind of where I've done the study, and the the data format is like gridded data, so it's like a um, a bitmap, but the pixels rather than being RGB, are, um, heights, elevation, meters above sea level, and the data format is a is a geotiff. Um, which is like a TIFF for image, but it has a header which tells you about where it is uh, geographically. So you can um, bang it straight on the map and it, it knows where it fits in. Uh, yeah, so that's where I got my terrain data from. And then to sort of test uh, the analysis I was going to do, we'll, we'll look back at a, a simple um, bit of terrain. So Mount Narahoe behind me in the photo uh, or Mount Doom, it's it's the simple cone volcano, so it should be a nice, easy case to try this stuff out on. Should be. <laughs> so here on the right is Mount Narahoe, a sort of topographic plot of that. Um, so nice, simple cone. And um, I I do things in Python. Um, it's it's not very complicated analysis that I've done, but I'll, I'll talk through a few bits of the code. Uh, so there's a package called Rasterio, which opens um, rasters, which is this, um, this GeoTIFF uh, elevation file I've got. Really easy, you get a big array of um, elevation to work with. And, um, and then we want to go and calculate those terrain details, like um, aspect and angle. And I'm sure that you can do this with GIS packages, but I did a lot of um, vector calculus at uni and I'm terrified of forgetting it all, so I kind of <laughs> take any opportunity I get to practice it. Uh, and it's pretty simple stuff, so we can calculate a gradient with a numpy gradient function, and that's um, like a numerical dif differentiation so it's telling you the rate of change in the x and the y direction. And then they're like vectors, so you can calculate the magnitude of those two right angle vectors with this sort of thing to get um, what the slope angle is. And then you can find the aspect by looking at the relative size of them. Sorry? Oh, like the grid size, yeah, yeah. I um I left that off to make it to remove, yeah, um yeah. So the grid, thanks for pointing that out, is uh, is eight meters, yeah. So there's there's some scaling in here for that, and then for um 
factors of pi and things like that, yeah. So let's look through um, what the analysis comes out at. So our, our cone, cone volcano on the left, um, so I don't have a color map, sorry, but the pale blue is zero degrees and then we come around to 360 degrees. So that's our compass bearing. And then um, we can digitize that, the plot on the right, into north, northeast, east, etc. So it fits with our other data. Um, yeah, so then for every gridded point, we have uh, an aspect value, northeast, southwest, etc. The, the slope angle on the left, the bright color is the steep areas and the blue is the flat areas. And from this, we can create a mask of where um, the slope angle is in our danger zone. So 30 to 55 degrees, which is the plot on the right. And then finally, elevation, which is the simple one. Um, a funny plot for elevation, but the bright colors are the high areas. And we want to break these down into our three um, elevation bands. Well, plus four out of range. So we've got out of range, low alpine, alpine, and then high alpine is not on it. Cool. So we've got what we want. Um, we've categorized the terrain at all points. And then we can apply... Um, this sort of thing. So we can we can map the um, the colors in these different regions onto our terrain um, based on based on that categorization we, we did for every every grid point. And we get this, um, which is awesome, really useful, kind of exactly what I had in mind. So you can kind of immediately see um, if I want to ski off Narahoe, I should go this way rather than this way. Yeah. There's some a few interesting features. So the kind of the points where we're out of color. So that's where the slope's fallen below 30 degrees, and we're out of that risk area. And then obviously here we have the transition between um, this uh, low alpine and moderate alpine range. Yeah, thanks for pointing it out. Um, yeah, so most avalanche accidents actually occur from people triggering the avalanche. So that they're, they're in the start zone and they set it off and then they get swept away. So people absolutely can get hurt um, or caught in an avalanche because of that as well, yeah. But um, it would be a minority of cases, yeah. But you're exactly right. We're only mapping the start zones. We're not mapping... Um, yeah, so, th so this will change. Um, yeah, so the, the one for today will look quite different to this one in the middle of the August. So this rose, well, this, this system has probably followed, I think there were a, a couple of weeks of strong winds and, and heavy snow, and it, it generated, and the wind was from the northwest, so it's depositing all the snow on the opposite side of, of um, well, not mountains, but of aspects, um, and removing all the snow on this side, yeah. And that's generated these slabs, which are, which are unstable. Right, and that's kind of um, where I wanted to get for a, a proof of concept, um, something pretty usable and useful, but what I um, really wanted was to have something which would run automatically when a new forecast gets issued every afternoon and something that I could um, navigate to on the web and share to my friends. Um, so that's where we're going to now. Um, I've kind of skipped over where the data comes from. Um, so the Avalanche.net.nz has a pretty obvious API that you can find um, just with your Chrome or um, Firefox browser tools. Um, and 
I mean, it's it's public, I guess. And <laughs> um, and it's just a simple dictionary type table, and it has all that information that was neatly displayed um, in the charts available to to pull and work with. Um, so the implementation I did, so I chose to use um, Mapbox to, to look at the maps, mostly because it was what they were already using in, um, on their Avalanche web page. And it looked like a nice little um, map product. And they have a really nice free tier. It seems quite generous. You get 50,000 free monthly loads. And all this without giving a credit card. Um, so I assume when you use them all up, it just stops working. And um, actually, this thing was more limiting. So that's tile requests, um, 750,000. But I've, I've found every time I go to the page and have a look around, I use about 100 tiles. So um, this kind of lim limits us more. But it's, it seems like a great platform to do home projects on, I think. 300 people a day can look at look at what I've done um, before we burn through this. And um, if people can use it, I think Mapbox is what Facebook use and what lots of the other guys use. Um, it's similar to the Google Maps products. Uh, they have some quite nice um, textures and displays and things like that. It's built on OpenStreetMaps. Um, Initially, yeah, but I think they've done a lot more to it. Uh, yeah, so that's where I want to put my um, maps. And the other part of the infrastructure is my Amazon machine, which used to be free tier, but now I have to pay for. And on this, I have my Python script, and it's running that final stage of the analysis that we just talked through, where we're mapping the colors in the, um, in the rows chart onto um, onto the map, and all the other stages, all the terrain calculations, you can you can do ahead of time and just have a, um, a reduced file to look at. Um, so it sits there, and every ten minutes, it, it's, there's a cron job, and it polls the um, the API, and it looks to see if there's a new forecast, and if there has, it'll run the analysis, and it'll um, and it'll export a GeoTIFF image, so that same format that we started with, except this time, instead of um, having elevations as um, the grid of data, we've, we'd, we do have RGB values. We've got those colors there. Um, once that's done, it um, does the Mapbox upload protocol, which is to push it to an Amazon S3 thing, and then Mapbox takes it away. and um, builds all the tiles for you and um, hosts it for you. And all that happens within about 30 seconds or so. So with this system, within 10 minutes of a new forecast getting issued, it should be, it should be viewable. Um, the only other bit of infrastructure is I have a, um, a Python Flask app, um, kind of to put personal projects on and things like that, and it's it's pretty easy to work with. Um, so let's go to that here and um, look at the map for the state that we've been investigating. Uh, so yeah, it works. We have we have a layer shading over um, the terrain template. And we're looking at the Mount Ruapehu, Mount Ruapehu here, so we can see this area. We have the Tūrō ski field, for those who know the area. In this area, we have the, um, the Whakapapa ski field. So I can look at this map and see it would be um, probably unwise and difficult to choose a path which avoids exposing myself to risk if I wanted to come from the Turo ski field and get to the, um, the summer areas. Whereas um, if I was starting on the other side, then you know there's much simpler um, 
paths which aren't exposed to risk to, to come up to the tops. Um, so yeah, it's kind of doing what I want. Um, there was some big avalanches uh, pretty much around the date that we've just been looking at um, above the Turo ski field set off by the ski patrollers um, trying to prepare the slopes for the masses. Um, so all this here is ripped out, all that's ripped out, all that's ripped out. Sorry, can you explain what we're looking at here? Like what, what do you mean by the avalanche? Sorry. <laughs> um, so on this slope there hasn't been an avalanche. On this slope here you can see we have this um, sort of slanting line dividing the area here and the area here. So that's, that's kind of the fracture line. So the snow below that line has slid as a giant slab and come down here and probably picked up a whole lot of other snow and run all the way down here and into this gully here. And it was, I saw videos of this and it was incredible. Um, yeah, so the, the ski field's over here. So they had the ski field all closed when they did this. And they were dropping dynamite um, from a helicopter. Yeah. Same thing over here. So this, all this slope here is released. And it's picked up a whole lot more snow here and then run all the way down here. So on the, on the top left, that fracture line across. This one. No, down, down one. Yep. Yeah, so this one, they probably set off this, and then as it slid, it triggered this one here as well. Does that mean that the top, top still might come down? Oh, so th this is already s um, slid, yeah. I, I think, you know, the violence of what they've triggered, e everything that was going to move has moved, yeah. So you can't look at that and go, there could still be something that could happen. No, nah, yeah. I think after a helicopter spends a morning up there, dropping like kilograms of, of explosives, um, <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd be happy, yeah. You, you know, you wouldn't want to go on an area where they haven't done that because you've seen that there's this potential to do it, so you don't know that you as a skier might, you know, might not trigger this. Oh yeah, sure. So yeah, that's that's the job of a, um, a ski patroller, or you know, <coughs> probably avalanche specialist ski patroller. Yeah, and I, I don't know. Yeah, like that part of it sounds pretty exciting, but it would be cold mornings and a um, lot of picking broken people up off a ski field and skiing them down in one of those banana stretches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we can see that um, I'll kind of point out the areas because um, you don't know it's the rain. But uh, those big avalanches we were just looking at, pretty much under the, the mouse area here. So it, it is all in, um, in these regions they were forecasting. Yeah. Um, if you know the Turo ski field, that chairlift is the high noon. Ski, um, chairlift? I did not. I was just comparing it to the map. So yeah. Yep. So, so those areas are, is that chairlift on that map? Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, that chairlift is this, this one here. So it ends here and then, and then these lines are kind of trail routes. Yeah. Um, one of the other great things about Flask is how easy it is to have, um, like a put a string query in the URL. So I can, well, it, when you go here, it's um, checking my um, map box space and it's taking whatever the latest um, uploaded images and it's, it's showing us that. But as you could see before, I can just add a, um, a date parameter to, the, to that and then it'll look for that one. So yeah, I'm not a I'm definitely not a web developer, but that sort of stuff's pretty easy to um, to get going. Yeah. Wow. 
No, definitely not. Um, so yeah, that's kind of wrapping up what I've done. So th this is this is a really useful tool for me uh, to help um, kind of visualize and understand what the information is and those um, forecasts that the experts are providing and um, seeing how that applies to the area I'm going. But it's, it's kind of just a planning <coughs> tip. So there's, there's all these um, good backcountry practices that still need to be applied if, if you go out skiing. Um, yeah, and th I mean, yeah, th so this is just the forecast and you need to look at what's happening around you and be, and be aware to that. Yeah, what's the question? Well, the dynamite guys are writing the um, the the forecast that that then I'm I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they might not have such a neat tool for for visualizing it on the terrain, but they will have tools, which is the next thing I've got here. So no, I haven't seen anyone do exactly like what I've done, but there is this app called FatMap, and you can um, you can kind of color. Um, areas by aspect and elevation and slope angle. Um, generally, I'm um, not quite sure how they do that, but it's the most expensive app I've ever seen. It's like $100 a year, and it's not linked to um, the bulletin, so you'd have to dial it all in uh, manually. So what I've done is much easier. And I've, um, I've shared this work with the people who run the bulletins, and they're pretty interested in it, and hopefully um, they might be looking to include it at some point in the future, which is kind of good validation for me. It's, um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So I don't have anything on mine yet, but I probably should, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I everyone who's who is in this world kind of know you know knows the limitations of a forecast and a tool and and stuff like that. Yeah, and like I was saying before, if you go outside and the snow starts wimping below you, you're making this um, noise where it's where it's settling below you, and you know you you're digging a snow pit to assess the stability and all that sort of stuff. So they're all things that you should be doing. Anyway, you like you can't just rely on a, a magic app to to do it all for you. And I, I mean, I, I think this user group is is well aware of that. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, and then limitations, as as um, was pointed out before. So it's only mapping the start zone, so not um, the paths an avalanche could slide through, as we saw before. And another thing I forgot to put up there was um, it's quite reliant on the terrain data being accurate, and that's already, um, I guess, filtered because it's um, on an eight meter grid, and it's been, um, yeah, it's actually generated from topo maps, so it's not like it's it started as a lidar image or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's possible that it would miss. It doesn't reflect all steep areas and that sort of thing. And just, I'll read the final point and we can do the questions. Uh, so the other thing I'd like to extend it to is all the other areas where there's uh, avalanche forecast across the country. Yep. Um. Uh, going back to the topography, yep. does the snow change the slope? Does that make sense? Like yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, and it would, but probably I mean, at the moment, they're saying they've got three metres of snow up there. That's kind of the height of the snowpack on, th on top of the terrain. So, and if that's, I mean, there's going to be thinner areas and thicker areas, but it, it's not going to drastically um, change, change it, yeah. But good question, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm fascinated by the subject, so I, I have read a bit about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's people have tried to build like dynamic models where you're actually physically 
modeling how this how these the snow mediums moving and that's really hard to do as you can imagine and the results I, d I don't think people have found hugely useful but um, certainly if, if you're building um, like a, a town in the Swiss Alps or something like that you'd probably um, consult with some avalanche modeling experts to, to run that sort of simulation and the other thing is just kind of empirical results so um, by that I mean like rules of thumb so um, what oh, they they don't define they define the run path kind of as an angle looking back up the slope which might be 12 degrees or something like that so that tells you how far it can run but that's an empirical result and that people have gone out and measured lots of slides and found what it generally is and applied that yeah do we have any other questions thank you very much thanks